morning, Crossroads Church. Would you stand as we have Easter worship this morning? There's a lot of talk. is for you an empty grave a life that's changed it all points to Jesus name if you've been searching and nothing's been working I've got good news and Jesus loves you Open up your eyes and look around. This is the place where your freedom is found. Take a minute, breathe it in, watch your life turn upside down. This is the good news. If you're breathing, it's for you. An empty grave, a life that's changed. It all points to Jesus' name. If you've been saved. Amen, and welcome to church this morning. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. It's okay to talk back a little bit today. Happy Easter. 
I'm Pastor Richie. This is my wife, Cindy, and we're so delighted to have you in church with us on this Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we just wanted just to tell you how, how thankful we are to be a part of a community like we're in. We truly believe that this is a special time in the history of our county, and we know that God has placed us here as a church body for something bigger than ourselves, and we're just so delighted to be here today with you to celebrate our risen Savior that's changed my life, that's changed her life, that's changed the life of almost everybody in the room today. And guess what? You're a candidate for change today as well. Amen. Amen. We have coming up over the next couple of weeks something very special. It is a sermon series called Feels, right? Feels. Feels. F E E. Are you in your fields? I don't know. You know, sometimes in life we have the spiritual up, spiritual down. There are times when we don't know if God is anywhere around. But we're going to take a journey kind of in the heart of the disciples after Jesus ascended. Because after Easter, what's next? You know, what's really next? So we're going to tackle some topics over the next few weeks that I think that you would, you would thoroughly enjoy and that you could grow closer to the Lord with. Because there are times in my life even when I feel like God is so far, far, far away. And I can get in my feelings about it. And I can get upset with him and mad at him. So we're going to handle topics like doubt. We're going to handle topics like even depression. We're going to handle uh, topics like loneliness and God's provision and his sovereignty over our lives. And we just invite you to come back next Sunday and the next Sunday as we take this journey to the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit came down and the church began. I think Mother's Day is a good thing, too, that's coming up, right, hon? That's coming up. A mother, your Mother's Day event called Adorned is for every oh, every, every lady. lady. It's not just a Mother's Day event. It's not just Mother's no. Day. It's like the ladies' conference night. Around maybe. Mother's Day. Yeah, around Mother's Day. That's right. That's right. So that's going to be also May be, 10th. May the Mark 10th. Your calendars. Hosted here. Yes, right. I got the microphone now, so okay, here we go. <laughs> so May May 10th. That's right. Mark your calendars. I have a friend of mine coming from Texas. She's hilarious. Her name's Hannah Cruz, and she is awesome. It is going to be so encouraging and just joyful. Like, I love when people just have the joy of the Lord, and you can see it. Not just It's not just on the inside. It's out here, too. That's right. Sometimes people Amen. say, I've got the joy of the Lord. I said, I need to see it on your face that's a little bit. need to see it on Just your a face. Little smile. So Just smile. all ladies, mark your calendars May 10th. Amen. That's so good. And, and we're just so thankful again. Uh, this coming Saturday is every first Saturday of the month. We have a men's breakfast and Bible study at 7 a.m. And then we, we roll into here at 8 o'clock. And we pray for an hour. And everyone's invited to that. We'd love to have you uh, to come to that as well. If you're new to the church and if you're visiting for the first time today, trust me, you're family. And we'd love to get to know you. Please take a moment to fill out uh, one of the Connect cards and turn that in upon exit today. But are you thankful for the Lord? Are you thankful that he's risen? Amen. Let's pray together and we'll continue in worship today. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this incredible day. This Resurrection Sunday, we can come together and we can worship you in spirit and in truth today. God, I thank you. It's all about Jesus today. It's all about the finished work of the cross of Calvary. It's all about the new creation that you give us. And Lord, we just ask that you would continue to do great and mighty things in our midst today as we honor you for new life in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
those tears, child. Put down your shame. Oh, oh I see an empty grave. I hear the heavens waking, angels in jubilee. Before I
Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned. Thousand angels surround your throne to bring you praise that will never cease. But hallelujah from here below is still your favor and melody. When we The fire that once burned bright become an ember my eyes can't see. I will remember your sacrifice. I will abide in your love for me. Oh, we
Come on, let's take a moment this morning before we go any further. If you feel comfortable, I want you to lift your hands. Let's just give a moment right now of reverence to the Lord for all that he's done. He's risen. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you today as we gather to get together today, Lord, for this incredible celebration of new life. And we're reminded of the great sacrifice that heaven gave on our behalf. God, we're humbled by that today. But Lord, I thank you that today there, there are still some that need to respond to you. So we pray together today that it's not with enticing words of man's wisdom that the gospel is presented, but it's through power and demonstration of the Spirit. As we lift up the name of Jesus today, the author and perfecter of our faith, Lord, we thank you for this, and we ask for all these things. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. Amen. Go ahead, clap if you'd like to today. Turn around to somebody, if you would, please, and shake their hand and welcome them to church this morning. All right, all right, all right. Happy Easter. If you would, please, I'd like for you to welcome to the stage three of my friends this morning. So come on, friends. Come on up to the stage today. All right. Their parents have no clue what's going on right now. Really, nor, neither do I. So, all right, y'all come on over here. We'll come right over here in this nice light right here. All right. Come here. Come here. Hey, Fisher, would you please keep your eye on that one right there, okay? All right. All right. Excellent. All right. Man, now you guys see what I have to look at every Sunday. Is it scary? No. 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 Not at all. You know, when when you're a, when you're a child, you dream. How many of you feel like you're still a child, right? Amen. So, but what, you're five years old. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. In the middle of the day, he's five years old. All right. All right. So. We're going to try to get to him in a minute. We're going to save him for last. His mom and dad are back there absolutely just just rolling around right now. But when you it's okay, buddy. It's okay. I know. Uh, but people ask you when you were when you're a kid, they ask you a question. And they ask you, now don't say anything yet. You don't say anything yet. So tell everybody your name. Fisher. All right, Fisher. Has anyone ever asked you, "Hey, Fisher?" What do you want to be when you grow up? Yes. Okay, what's your answer? Tell the people. Uh, MLB player. Oh, he wants to be an MLB player. He wants to be a baseball player professionally. You ready to do that, huh? I have seen some pictures and videos of this guy playing baseball. There's a there's a good chance of that, Fisher. That's pretty awesome. All right. Did, did anyone ever, I mean, have you ever responded, hey, when I grow up, I want to be absolutely broke. No, no, right, right. All right, tell everybody your name. Huntley. Huntley. All right, Huntley. Has anybody ever asked you what do you want to be when you when you grow up? No. Okay. Well, guess what? On the count of three, we as a, uh, uh, as, as a church body are going to ask Huntley what she wants to be when she grows up. One, two, three. I want to be a teacher when I grow up. When, when you grow up, Huntley, what do you want to be? A police officer. Oh, police officer. I like that. So we have a ball player. We have a police officer. Now, good looking. I mean, looking. Hey, hey, what's happening? What has anyone ever asked you what you want to be when you grow up? An astronaut. He wants to be an astronaut. What? Do you know? Did you know this fun fact? This is a fun fact. The most expensive thing that this world has ever produced is the International Space Station. To date, it is worth over $150 billion. So you want to go to the space station or go into space? You want to go to Mars? Where do you want to go? To God. That was not rehearsed. 
that was not rehearsed. That was not rehearsed. Lucan, it's time for the altar call, son. I think everybody's ready right now. It's time for the altar call. All right, put, put it right here. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Miss Cindy, next Sunday, if you're all in church next Sunday, Miss Cindy's going to have an incredible gift for you guys, okay? Thank you so much. You like gifts. I know he like. I want to let him go ahead and go now. Liberty, could you come get him, please? Y'all put your hands together for our great, great and wonderful children this morning. Huntley, Fisher, go on, Miss Liberty. You know, surprisingly, when you're asked when you're a little kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? We say things like that. When I was Fisher's age, I wanted to be, um, I wanted to play for the Atlanta Braves. At that, at that time, uh, I believe his name was Glenn Hubbard, was the second baseman. He was about five foot four, I think. He was a small fella. And I knew I was probably going to be a small fella. My mom's five foot. My grandmother's five foot. My uh, sister's about five foot. My grandfather was about five foot. So I knew it wasn't in the cards for me to be tall. And I think, hey, if Glenn could do that and play for the Braves, I think I could too. We're, we're often asked those questions when we're young, but when we grow up, we don't ask ourselves those questions any longer because we're, we're grown. See, when you're, when you're in middle school and high school and you have this, this idea that you want to be a doctor one day, then hopefully a counselor will sit down with you and your parents and map out a plan for you to accomplish the goal of being a doctor. Now, we don't start out with, the, with a dream, like I asked Fisher. We don't start out with a dream of being 40 years old and completely broke. We don't start out with the dream as a little kid. You know, when I grow up, I want to be all by myself and lonely. Or I want to be sad. Or when I grow up, I want to be depressed and I want to be anxious. Or, you know, when I grow up, I want to be so overworked that I'm tired all the time. That's not a dream of ours when we're young. Not at all. Those thoughts, even they never even cross our minds. But life happens to us. It punches us in the face. It blacks our eye. And we wake up one day and we're wondering where in the world things went wrong. I remember when I was a kid, I wanted to do this, but now I'm 35 years old. And it's not the picture that I had of when I was a little kid. Where did my dream go? We encounter loss and heartbreak and disappointment and failure. And those things, they, for some, they motivate them to go forward, but for others, they lock down in that state and seemingly take residence or reside in that state of brokenness. You know, in times of distress and abandonment, we look to the sky at times, and what do we do? We say, where... Are you, God, in this thing called my life? For if God is, and we hear it all the time, if God is all-loving, if God is all-knowing, if God is all-powerful, why in the world do I don't have what I want? Why in the world has life not worked out like I thought it was going to work out? It's a question that humanity asks and oftentimes points and blames God for the things that have happened in our lives. And it's an extremely tough question to answer. Where is God in this thing called life? But the answer is really quite simple. God's always here. He's never left us. He's never abandoned us. In fact, we'll, we'll get to this probably next week, but when Jesus ascended after defeating death, hell, and the grave, he said, as a sign that I will not leave you as orphans, Holy Spirit, God himself will come down and not only dwell among you, but will dwell inside of you. But the world we live in, guys, today, it's cursed. Adam and Eve did that. When they disobeyed God right at the beginning, what happened? This earth became cursed. You want to know why we have to work so hard to get potatoes to grow? Work so hard for, for things to grow in the ground? It's because the ground is cursed. It's cursed because of disobedience. It's, it's cursed because of sin. But God did something about 
that curse. And that's what Easter really is all about. See, in the beginning of time in creation, in the creation story, when you have Adam and you have Eve and and God gives them a simple command, he says, you can do anything you want, but don't do this. Isn't that like us, right? You can do anything, you can have anything you want, but you can't have this. So the enemy uses that one thing and begins to put that out in front of your face. And the enemy came into the garden with with Eve and began to, to have a conversation with her about what God really said. And the enemy twisted what God said. And Eve believed it. And when she believed it, she fell prey to the lies of the enemy. And through disobedience, sin entered into her and into Adam and into this world. And every single generation since has a problem with sin. Sin separates us from God. It does. Sin, when fully grown, the Bible says, bring forth death. And with sin being passed from generation to generation, what are we going to do? Because sin is the sickness of humanity. It is the disease this world currently has. And sin must be dealt with. So how did God deal with sin? Did God have a plan for sin? Absolutely, he did. The Bible says before the foundations of the world, the lamb was slain. What does that mean, pastor? This is what it means. Before any of this stuff happened, God already knew. Due to the free will of man, that man would sin, that man would turn their back on him. But he also knew that he had to give up himself to repair what man had broken. That his plan was to send himself to pay for the penalty of sin. See, sin is a debt that you and I, we can't pay. I got, I got a little bit of money, but I don't have a lot of money. Some of you have a whole lot more money than I do. But you still can't pay for the debt of sin. Your good works can't pay for the debt of sin. You can't be good enough to pay for the debt of sin. You, and I'm going to say this, and Lord, don't misinterpret this. You can't come to church enough to pay for the debt of sin. You can't give enough money in the offering to pay for the debt of sin. You can't help your brother enough to pay for the debt of sin. The only thing that would pay the debt that sin has is God himself. And he did that through the life of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus came and he offered his life for our life. He took upon himself the sins of this world and defeated death and defeated sin by rising from the grave. There's been a lot of people that have proclaimed to be the Messiah. There's been a lot of people that have proclaimed that they're the answer, that they're the way. But when death, once death comes to their door, they can't conquer it. But death came to the door of Christ um, and he chuckled and he laughed uh, because he knew that death would not hold him. He knew that death could not contain him. For he had spoken everything into existence and humbled himself as a man to be hung on a cross to die for you and for me. To take the penalty that we deserve. We deserve that penalty. We deserve to be separated from God. But God showed his love to us so so strongly that what did he do? That he gave his son just for us. So instead of us in our life where we are wondering why things are happening to us and where's God in the midst of all of this, what we really have to ask is that we have to look in the mirror and ask the question, who am I? Who am I? Why would God do this for me? I'm not good enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough fame. I haven't done enough good things. Why would God do this for me? Some would even say, well, I could see God doing it for them, but nothing ever good happens to me. So why would God do that for me? Let me remind you today.
according to the scriptures, that you are somebody who is loved. You might be here today and you might not have heard those words, those sincere words from anyone in a long time. But hear them from the scriptures today that you are loved. John 3.16 says, for God did what? He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He loves you enough to give of himself for you. Romans 5, 8 tells us that, but God showed what? He showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. <clears throat> That's how much he loves you. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. The greatest love ever shown is the love that we're celebrating this week where Jesus is on display, his love's on display for all to see because God gave, God showed, and God released himself to show the world how much he loves them. See, there are a lot of people that say, I love you with words, and words are fine. But man, when it's put into action, is deeper than that. You can tell me all day that you love me, but in the midnight hour when I call you and I need you, are you going to be there? You can tell me all day long that you care about me, but on my darkest day, are you going to be the light that I need to get me through that day? You can tell me words all day long, but what are you backing your words up with? We can ask God those things, and he will say this, I backed up my words with my son. I backed up my words by sending forth from myself my firstborn son to die on a cross for you, to take the penalty that you deserve, put it upon himself. The earth shook and the, the sun stood still and things went dark as Jesus took that final, final breath. But he took that for us so that we could have eternal life with him because we're loved. We're loved. God created us with his own hands out of dirt at the very beginning. We're loved. We're crafted. We're loved. And number two, you're somebody who is valued. You have value. Fisher said, I want to be a major league baseball player. He's not saying it right now, but he might say it as, as that little boy grows up to be a man, that I find my value in who, in what, excuse me, in what I do. I find my value because I'm a major league baseball player. Or Huntley, I find my value because I'm a police officer. Or even Luke, and I found my value because I'm an astronaut. But when you can catch the glimpse of, of, of the, the heavenly language that says your value is not wrapped in what you do. Your value is who you are. Because God didn't look, look down and, and, and look at Jesse and say, well, Jesse, you're, you're a state trooper, so because you're valuable as a straight state trooper, I'm going to die for you. He didn't say that. It said he came and died for us while we were still sinners. So you are valuable. You might not think you're valuable. Well, I'm not valuable, Pastor. There's nothing I have to offer. Oh, what a lie of the enemy today. You are somebody who was valued. And you're valuable because of what it cost. What you cost. So how am I valuable? If God sent forth his only son to die in our place, that's a value that's immeasurable. You can't put a, a price tag on that. He went through the greatest of lengths that ever was and never ever will be, be again, and he did it just for you. That's how valuable you are. Well, I don't have much value. I, I don't think I'm worth hardly anything. Well, you're worth everything. Heaven emptied it himself just for you. My goodness. The Bible says that as one loved by God, you also have been chosen by God as well. Adopted as sons by Jesus Christ himself, the book of Ephesians tells us. He made us accepted into the beloved because of Jesus Christ. We have 
a redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ, the, the, the life given that we are redeemed, we are bought back, we have so much value. We're bought back. You're not only valuable because of what you cost, you're valuable because of what you can become. He's got a plan for you and a purpose for you. You might not see for yourself, but even this little pastor here, I see the value in you for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's almost immeasurable how valuable you can become to God's work and to mankind. So the value that God has placed on you is the value you should place upon yourself. I hear people say, well, Pastor, I just don't feel like I have any self-worth. I don't feel like I'm worth anything. Let's change that stinking thinking for a moment. And let's re- just be reminded today of the price that, that heaven paid, that God paid for you. And that price was so high, that means that you're so valuable because of the price that was paid. Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. Paul prayed this, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Ephesians 3 and 17 He's not referring to something temporary where God will just come in for a moment and and be there for you and then leave. But no, he wants to dwell with you. He wants to be with you permanently. He wants to be your best friend. You can experience Christ's extravagant love this morning. I promise you, you can. He wants to he wants to show you today how high and how wide and how deep and how long his love is for you and for me. And you can truly live a fulfilled, satisfied life here on this earth. John 10, 10, he came to give us life and give it more abundantly. That you can live that today when you live it in and through the power and the fullness that God wants to give you and me. So not only are you loved, not only are you valuable, but you're somebody who is a masterpiece. Not a master mess but a masterpiece. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God's power is not limited. He can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask, think, or even can imagine today. That the good things that he's planned for you and I come when we accept him into our life and we accept what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. Because God can do a great work within you. He can. That divine love and power, it it, it can exceed our imagination as he works in and through us. And the spirit of God strengthened us to do things that we never thought we could ever do before. Pitcher said he wanted to be a major league baseball player. I wanted to be, when I got turned to age 13, I wanted to be a professional golfer. So this is what I did. Every morning before I went to school, I went outside in, in the yard and I practiced. Every afternoon after school. The bus would actually drop me off at the golf course. I wouldn't even go home, and I would practice. I get into college, and, and, and I'm playing in college, and every morning before I went to my 8 o'clock German class to try to deal with Frere Wall and her old mean self. Whoo, that woman was mean. I would get, get, go to the driving range up there on, on the campus, and I would hit golf balls until my fingers would bleed. I had a problem with putting. I, I didn't like it. It didn't like me, so my coach made me sleep every night with my putter. He said, you're going you're gonna to have a relationship with your putter. Every day, I'm right there. I mean, I'm, I had to carry it with me to class. Rocky, I had, I had bandages all over my hands. I'd be trying to, to write in class, and, and blood would come from my hands and fall on the paper. And every day I said, I'm going to be a professional golfer. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. And I worked, 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 and I worked. Two years into college, God began to do a work in my heart and started to change me. And God said, that's, that's a great dream you have, but the dream I have for you far exceeds the level 
of professional anything. What I want to do in and through you is much bigger than what you think you can accomplish. Because what I want to do through you, you can't do on your own. But you need my power to work inside of you. See, God can give you a dream, a spiritual dream, but he'll never leave you alone to accomplish it on your own. If he gives you a spiritual dream, what he's going to do is that he's going to give you the power uh, from on high to make sure that that dream comes, comes to fruition. He's going to do that. That's what he's doing. Do I have from time to time thoughts of being a professional golfer? Absolutely. Does my human flesh wonder sometimes when I see guys that I beat like a drum when I was a teenager and in college making millions on TV? I beat them like a drum. I embarrassed them. Do I think about it? Sure. But when I lay down at night, I have peace in my soul. When I close my eyes, I have a calmness from heaven. It doesn't come from accomplishments from this world, but comes from serving the Lord and from accepting what he's done for me and for you on Calvary. See, this new creation, that this masterpiece that he talks about, this masterpiece is the new creation. You are God's handiwork when you allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life. When you allow Jesus to come in and, and sit upon the throne of, of your heart and be the Lord of your life, you become a new creation. The Bible says old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And then God steps back. And he says, wow. There's my masterpiece. There's my handiwork. There's my creation. It's never God's will or desire. To be apart from him. Sin does that. But sin because of the accomplishment of Jesus Christ on the cross in the empty tomb. Sin is eradicated. It's done away with. It has no more power. I want to close with this this morning. What I love about. Valuable things. is that valuable things attract people to them, right? Think about it. I don't know if anyone knows that this new car that's out right now that looks like a square box thing. It's a weird-looking car. I I couldn't remember the name of this thing, but it's it's incredible. It's like a square box-looking thing. It looks like something from, like, a 70s sci-fi show, but it's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I think my Jeep's kind of nice, but it's a Jeep. Just empty every pocket, right? It's a Jeep, right? So I've par- I parked about f- four rows down from this incredible-looking car. No one was walking by saying, wow, that's a nice Jeep. Man, that's pretty. Man, look at the wheels on that thing. That's nice. I, mean, I had one guy look at it the other day and said, that thing would probably run better if you took that Georgia tag off the front of it. Right? <laughs> I figured I'd get an amen on that one. But no one looked at that. What did they look to? They looked to the most valuable thing in the parking lot. Valuable things attract people to them. When, again, this is not in self-conceit. you got to hear me on this. When you can understand your heavenly worth, when you can understand your, the, the spiritual gift that God has given each one of us, when you can understand how much he loved you, that he died for you, and that when you accept that into your life, when you accept that, that payment of, of, of sin, that debt freedom, when you accept it in your life, then you become a new creation. You become God's masterpiece. You become his glory on display to where people are going to notice They're going to notice this. They're going to say stuff like this. Well, I knew you, and I'm going to use the old school term for those that are over the age of 40, right? You used to be old beat up Pinto. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You used to be just an old rag of a person. 
You used to that like you didn't look good. You didn't act good. There wasn't nothing good about you. You barely kept going forward. But something's changed in you. You've had a remodeling or something. Something's different. You, you got a new engine inside of you or something. Something's different about you. What is it? It's the power of Jesus Christ that comes inside of the person who accepts him. And then they become valuable, so valuable, that it's attractive to the world and the world sees it. When I was in the, in the military, I was in the United States Air Force. And, and when I went into the Air Force, I, I really didn't want to fly in a plane. I know that's weird. I didn't want to go in the Navy because I didn't want to ride on a boat. But I took that ASVAB test, and they, they said, yep, you're an Air Force geek. You go there, right? So I did. And I had to study aircraft from all over the world. We had to study and know the inner workings of the Air Force One, which, by the way, has a value of over $660 million. A whole country can operate from that one aircraft. There are multiple of those aircraft, by the way, but there's one true one. And its value is nearly $700 million. And I remember catching a glimpse of it when it came to the Shaw Air Force Base where I was stationed at. And it was majestic, beautiful. And I knew how much it was worth but I knew what it was carrying. As a believer, you carry the answer to this world. Jesus, has, when he started his earthly ministry, he would say stuff like this. He would say, come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He would look at people who had no value, so to speak, and no high-ranking religious stat stature. He would say, yeah, you're a fisherman. Yeah, I want you. Yeah, you're a tax collector. Yep, I need you. Yeah, you're this and that. Yeah, I need you. And they would respond. His call still goes out. And I've just come by today to tell you, number one, that you're loved. Number two, that you're valuable. And number three, you can be a masterpiece. You can be a masterpiece for Jesus when you just receive him. Receive him. Amen? Just receive him. Would you stand with me this morning? Some of you might feel this way, but Jesus never has his hand on our back to push us forward. But he's always in the front of us saying, come on, I'm leading you. For the past four weeks, we've been saying, come on, somebody. What is that call? That call is that you are somebody in Christ Jesus. You are loved, you are valuable, and you're a masterpiece. And he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And all you have to do is say yes to him. Don't listen to the lie of the enemy that says, but this, but this, but this. Mm, don't worry about that. God knows you, yet he still loves you. He wants to transform your life today. So this call today is for those that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ first. You don't know who he is. Maybe you've been kind of seeking and on the fence about this, and maybe you've tried everything else, but you find yourself lonely, hurt, broken, damaged and he wants to repair you today in fact he wants to create you anew the Bible calls you a new creation in Christ Jesus all you have to do is answer him and the answer is yes there might be some today maybe even watching this online you might be away from God you might have taken a step back from him step forward correct that today repent step forward back to him and thirdly, you might be here needing a physical touch, a healing in your body. He took those stripes for us for our healing. You can be made whole today. So I want to pray for you. And as we pray today, 
Again, God's not going to, Jesus is not going to shove you in the back. He doesn't do that. He welcomes you from the front. He says, come on. And we're offering today eternal life, the debt that's been paid in full by the life of Jesus Christ, the death and resurrection of Christ himself. It's paid in full. It's a free gift. All you have to do is accept it. Would you pray with me today? Lord, we love you today. God, we, we thank you. We honor you today. We honor you for who you are and what, you, what you've accomplished and what you've done. Lord, I thank you that today that you have reminded us how loved we are. You've reminded us how valuable we are. You've reminded us that, that we can be your masterpiece. God, we, we can be your handiwork. Lord, we can be that creation that you set out for at the very beginning with Adam. We can be that through accepting Jesus into our hearts and our lives today. So if you'd say today, today's my day, Pastor. I'm ready to give my heart to God today. I'm ready to be loved. I'm ready to be valued. And I'm ready to be God's masterpiece today. I'm ready to be new. Slide your hand up right now. That's me. That's me today. That's me today. That's me today. Lord, I thank you today for an opportunity like this to where we can ask for you to make us anew, and you do that. Lord, I pray for the ones today that step, taking a step back from their relationship with you. Lord, I pray that they take a step forward. And God, for those today that are dealing with physical ailments, Lord, I thank you that you're our healer. And that you're healing us completely. Lord, I love you today and I thank you. I give you honor in all ways. Just, just a moment. Just a moment to think of his goodness. Behold, all things are new. Lord, we give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Would someone put your hands together today and give God thanks for Easter? So thankful for the band and the singers and the youth and the children. And for all the hard work that's gone with all the volunteers to get ready for a day like today. Honey, come back up here real quick. We're so thankful again. Our ushers are going to go to the back in just a moment. But we have a, uh, out front, there is a photo booth. It says, you are somebody. We really want you to grab that into your heart and understand that you are somebody. So upon leaving today, Make sure you stop by there and take pictures and get engaged with that out front. But we're so thankful. We've seen a lot of faces here today. And I'm telling you, this is one of the biggest days of the church is, is Easter Sunday. But we thoroughly, thoroughly encourage you to come back uh, next week and the next few weeks as we tackle the tough top topics of being in our field, right? Being in our field. So just know that when you leave today that you're loved. You're loved by God and you're loved by us. That you're valued and that you're his masterpiece. Amen. God bless you. Have a great and wonderful Easter morning. And we'll see you back very, very soon. God bless you.